Hey everybody, welcome back to the Rideshare Hub. I'm Jacob Lepman. We've got a video in store for you today. It's a slightly depressing topic, so I am sorry about that, but it is very important and very informative, and it is about why driving rideshare doesn't make sense financially. I know. I'm just as disappointed to make this video, believe me. But knowledge is power. We want to give you guys all the information. So we'll, we'll get into it. Hey, before we get started though, a way that you can help supplement, make some more income as a driver. Uh, if you go into the video description below, there's a link there for what's called Cargo, Cargo Snack Box. Uh, click on that link, go to the website. You can use our referral code, RideshareHub1, number one, and uh, you're gonna get signed up, order that. It's a box full of snacks cool things that sits in your car and passengers can purchase things from you via the app. The top 10% of earners with that uh, are drivers. They make $300 extra a month. That's awesome. A lot of drivers on average make around $100. So extra money in your pocket. And we want to help you out. So check that out in the video description below. All right, you guys. So uh, here's what I'm going to say. First of all, there is a reason why there are so many drivers protesting driving for Uber and Lyft. It's not just because they woke up and they were like, let's go protest because that sounds like a good thing. I'll get some coffee and go protest. It's because a lot of drivers have a hard time covering all of their expenses, um, still making enough to live off of, putting money aside to cover things, um, you know, like, well, there's still expenses. Anyway, that's why, because drivers are having a hard time making enough money. And so we're going to get into the nitty gritty of that and really break it down for you. Um, so the deal is Uber and Lyft, uh, they saw an opportunity with transportation market in that, especially specifically taxis, uh, a lot of times were slow, dirty, um, expensive. That's probably one of the biggest factors right there. And they said, well, Uber said, hey, we can do it better. We have a great idea. Um, and Lyft jumped on and they said, yes, this is good. Let's get some of that market share. So uh, typically to take over a portion of market, what you do is you come out with an innovative technology and you keep your prices low and that will incentivize um, consumers to use your product so that you can gain market share ultimately hopefully taking over a big portion of that that's great for them right they're making making money um, even though they haven't they're not turning a profit it's because of their expenses are still high anyway that's a whole that's a different story now the thing is also to do that you incentivize people to come work for you um, so you're incentivizing everybody. You're giving out promo codes uh, for new passengers to get money off of their rides. You're incentivizing new drivers to come um, by getting big bonuses, sign-on bonuses, or, uh, or bonuses while you're driving, that kind of stuff. And then, so what's happened, right, is they're taking over, taking over this market, and when you do that, that's usually when you start to raise your prices. And uh, that would be a win for, you know, and it doesn't have to be drastic, but that's typically what you do. You take over the market, then you raise your prices. And yeah, so they haven't really done that though, have they? They're trying to avoid that. They've done things like Uber Pool and Lyft Line, which actually lowers the prices. Um, so anyway, I, I digress back to what we're talking about here. So here are some of the issues as drivers. Well, we're not employees, we're independent contractors, which there's some benefits, as we know. We get to make our own schedules, and uh, maybe that's it. <laughs> we get to pick when and where we wanna drive, and that is the biggest thing that Uber and Lyft have in their pockets of keeping us as independent contractors, um, which, is, which is fine, that's fine. Here's, here's the thing, this is what happens. This is one of the pitfalls of capitalism. And this is where you get a lot of Democrats and Republicans that butt heads over stuff. But, I mean, here's the thing, right? You have a business. Businesses are not, they're not incentivized to take great care of their employees. They're incentivized 
to pay their employees the bare minimum, but maybe take care of them, make it look good, and keep a lot of money for other expenses and pay higher executives and shareholders if uh, the company is public. So, okay, so they're not incentivized to like take good care of us. We're the low man on the totem pole. And uh, so then what happens is you have drivers start to protest because we're not making enough money and our expenses are high. And then you have the government step in and they don't really know the ins and outs of, they don't know the specifics of what we're going through uh, to make it better. So they do things that can sometimes make it worse in trying to fix the problem. And then you get really screwed up systems and it'll be interesting to see where things play out with the ride share, uh, ride share as a whole because the ship has not yet sailed and the final note has not been sung on how this will all play out. So pay close attention to what's happening in California. Uh, we have other videos on that. Anyway, the issue, if, if Uber and Lyft were like, hey, let's make sure that our drivers make $20 an hour no matter what, I don't think anybody would be complaining. And if they were, they would not be in the majority. I think a lot of drivers would be just fine with that. Um, yeah, okay. And that's before tips. They're outsourcing paying us by saying that tips is a part of it. It's not. It's not. It doesn't come from them. They're outsourcing that payment to the passengers. So just that rhetoric, don't listen to it. I need to be back on track here. So one of the problems, why it doesn't make sense financially, is we don't have benefits like full-time employees, meaning that uh, if you're in an accident and you're in the hospital, you don't have... Um, you don't have you're not covered for that, right? You're not making money. You're laid up and who's paying your health care costs? You are. Um, you don't get paid vacation. Uh, let's see. You don't get money you put into a retirement like 401k, uh, matching programs like that. You don't get any of that stuff. Um, okay, so that's one thing. Real, real issue here that I want to address is... The vehicle, right? Uber and Lyft, they don't have fleets of vehicles that they have to pay for. They outsource that cost to us, to you, to bring your own vehicle. Now, your vehicle is your asset, meaning, right, you're paying for that, paying into it. That is your asset, something that you will own once it's paid off, or if you already paid it off, great. It's your asset. Now, the issue is we're devaluing depreciating our asset driving drastically. And I have some hard numbers for you on that to give you an example. My Mazda 3 that I'm sitting in now, I bought it in 2016. It's a 2015. I bought it with 40,000 miles on it. Um, the average amount of miles that a person drives who's not driving rideshare in a year is roughly 12,000 miles. If you get a lease on a vehicle, it's roughly around 12,000 miles, okay? Here's what I'm gonna do for you. I'm gonna pretend that I never drove rideshare and that I drove my vehicle 15,000 miles a year since buying it in 2016. So now it's been three years. I've put 15,000 miles on it a year, so I have a total of 85,000 miles on it. I originally paid $13,000 for this vehicle. Now, three years later, I checked the Kelly Blue Book. I recommend you guys do this as well. Go to Google Kelly Blue Book. You can check the vehicle or the, um, what your vehicle is worth, right? So you plug in all your information, it'll give you a number. You wanna check not what the trade-in value to a dealership is, but what the private market is. You'll be able to see that at the end because um, car dealerships are gonna give you a lesser amount for your trade-in. Anywho, okay, 85,000 miles and uh, three years later, my vehicle would have been worth $9,000. But I drive for rideshare, and so I have 140,000 miles on my vehicle, and my vehicle is worth $6,500. Now, that's a difference in $2,500, you guys. That is a substantial amount. My vehicle's almost appreciated $1,000 a year. That's crazy. So we're taking an asset that a lot of us don't own. I still owe $5,700 on my car. 
and we're paying into that monthly and um, and we're depreciating it. So you're depreciating something you don't even know, which does not make sense financially. It is not a smart, smart financial move. So anyway, again, you can go to Kelly Blue Book and check that out and compare the differences so you can kind of see how much your car has depreciated. Now, the real issue we get into is when people pay too much for their vehicle, they get a newer vehicle that's going to depreciate a lot quicker, um, especially if you get a new vehicle, and uh, you're going to have high payments, and you can end up owing more on your vehicle than what it's worth because of how much you're depreciating it by driving so many miles. And that's, that's a problem. You don't want to be in that situation. So what about rental cars, Jacob? Huh? We didn't talk about that. So here's the thing. All of those rental car options that are out there, those are out there because there's someone that has money that saw an opportunity to make more money by giving you kind of a crappy deal. And let me explain. Lyft rental car program, when it first started, you were able to, they had a bonus tier where if you gave so many rides a week with that rental car, you could get money taken off how much it costs. That's gone now. I just found that out. That's a bummer. It's not there. Maybe they'll bring something back like that. I don't know, but it's not there right now. So the deal is to get a rental car with Lyft here, it costs 262-ish with tax um, dollars a week. 262 a week. You guys, I pay 275 a month on my vehicle. You're paying a thousand dollars a month to drive. Holy cow! You got to drive so much to offset those costs. Now. Great, granted, I understand the wear and tear. You don't have to worry about that stuff, the maintenance, those things, which is actually not entirely true. Uh, small print says you have to pay for tire damage or windshield damage and, and a $1,000 deductible. So if anything happens to that vehicle, you have to pay $1,000 before the insurance takes care of it shysty man it's not a good deal it's not a good deal we have a lot of videos talking about great vehicle values out there to look for um please pay attention to that because we don't want you taking your own your asset to this job that you probably use for personal use to and devaluing it and if anything happens to it then you're in a real bind and guess what you're not an employee so uber and lyft are like sucks to suck bro sorry okay um Let's see. Some other reasons why it doesn't make fin financial sense to drive for Uber or Lyft. Uh, there is a major lack of consistent earnings, right? Uh, and here's a great example where I live in Phoenix because it's very seasonal here. So you can make a, you can make good money or better money in the winter time, fall, winter, spring. But in the summertime, it's totally dead. And uh, I've done the math. There's been some times where before expenses, I made $11 an hour driving. Before expenses. It's not good. It's not good. Um, most, okay, so driving for rideshare as a job is rated just barely above working at a fast food restaurant. And it's because of our expenses. And although our expenses are write-offs, remember you guys, write-offs just save you from paying tax money to Uncle Sam. You still have to pay tax money, um, but it's not money in your pocket. It's not more money in your bank account, right? Uh, also, I should say that I found an article out there that said the average independent contractors make about $32 an hour before expenses. We, rideshare driving brings that average down too by quite a bit. So, just want you to know all of this stuff so you can make decisions moving forward financially that work for you. I'm not telling you to quit driving. I'm telling you that be smart about it, educate yourself, watch our videos, gain knowledge, make smart decisions. Um, definitely don't buy a new car to drive for rideshare in. Get something used, especially if you can pay cash for it, then that's great. Uh, then you don't have to worry about that expense. Um, and here's the thing, you guys, I want you to, 
seriously, I hope you take this to heart. The reason why Uber and Lyft get away with what they're doing is that, look, and they're not all terrible, but the reason why what they're doing works and they keep people in the dark and uh, it's because of confusion. Confusion and lack of knowledge and education keeps people in the dark. And there's so many inconsistencies across the board with earnings and it's so situational, it works in their favor because they can say, look, these guys here in, uh, in LA during these hours, they're making, they make 40 bucks an hour. Meanwhile, someone else somewhere somewhere else is making $10 an hour. So educate yourselves. All right, that's it. I'm done. Off my soapbox. If you guys have anything that you would like to add to this, jump into the comment section below. Love to hear thoughts and feedback. You guys are awesome. I'm Jacob Letman. This is the Rideshare Hub. Until the next time, drive safe, everybody.